Perfect. Okay. Well, we have a smaller group here so far tonight, and but we don't want to penalize you guys for being on time. So we will get started in just a, a little bit here. I'll give people just another few seconds to see if anybody else joins us right away. Okay, well, I'm sharing the results of our mini little poll here. We had one with ducks, one with turkeys, and a few with other, and then in the chat, I think a couple of you said that you just have chickens. And then as far as facility side of things, you know, one with separate facilities for each species, uh, a couple of you with just the one species, and then one with multiple co-mingled. Um, and then if our information was in there for Jill and I, we would, say that we have ducks along with our chickens and we actually do not have separate facilities either so we'll be talking about some of that later so okay well uh, a few of you have seen th this type of information but i'm going to run through a couple of intro slides here just to remind everybody about the legalities of owning poultry and it isn't too difficult but there are a couple of things you do need to to remember uh, one is is to make sure that you can have poultry where you live uh, and not all places allow that whether it's town village or city and if they do they may have some limits on things whether it be numbers or sex of birds or some other parameters so always double check first it's always a good idea and then the other thing that you do need to have in the state of Wisconsin is state of Wisconsin is a premise ID so and that applies to anything but it is free I forgot to change that slide uh, it's three-year renewal not annual but you do not have to report numbers just species so it's very easy to fill out and it is really only meant for one primary thing and that's to be able to foster communication if we have some kind of a communicable animal disease working its way through the state so it is very simple process. You can go online to do it where you just go on to the WIID.org and then hit the register your premises tab right in the center of the page. And then you can download the application form, fill it out and send it in, or you can register online. And it literally, if you have a good connection, only takes a couple of minutes. Um, the first page is going to be your contact information, and then the second page is going to be the farm's physical address, and then just a check off set of boxes for which species you <clears throat> have on hand now or plan to have in the next couple of years is the easy way to do it. Um, you can go in and change that if you do add a species, uh, so that's not a hard thing to do. You can also register over the phone. So here's the phone number for that. It's a toll free number. Just simply have all of your contact information ready and then call the Wisconsin Livestock Identification Consortium at that toll free number. And everyone will be getting the PDF versions of some of the uh, of these types of slides in some follow up emails. I've been waiting to do that until the end of the series. So I'll be getting that done probably next week because I'll be in the field the rest of this week. But unless you sell poultry products, you actually don't need any other permits or licenses then. But, uh, and for those of you who joined us last week or may be interested in watching the taped version of that eventually, um, we did go through all of the legalities with the DATCAP personnel last week regarding sales of poultry products and they did a really good job with that. So I'll leave it at that for now and find the stop sharing button there it is <laughs> and then we can move on to ron so uh tonight we're going to start off we are going to be focusing on non-chicken poultry management this evening so ron is going to be leading off and then my wife jill and i are going to be leading a discussion at the end of the evening on duck management all right, thanks, Scott. You can see my slides okay? Okay. Yes. <laughs> thanks. Um, 
So yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about some other poultry species. I'll, I'll tell you in the interest of time, I have information on turkeys and guinea fowl in my slides. Um, happy to answer questions about other things. And, and for a lot of these, you know, things like pea fowl are gonna be pretty similar. Um, <clears throat> Scott will talk about ducks. So um, yeah, if you have questions about other things, certainly let me know, but, but I thought I'd focus on those two as we go through. Um, sort of like I've done in the past, if you've seen any of the other talks, I'm gonna kind of go over a lot of topics and if you have more questions about something, want to go deeper into it or, or don't follow it, certainly let me know and I'm happy to answer other questions. But try to cover a little bit about a lot of things and, and we'll see where we go from there. So, <clears throat> so turkeys, guineas, etc. And, and I said really in general, a fair amount of the management is similar to that for chickens. So if you have chickens or are familiar with them, a lot of it's going to be very similar and you'll see that. But there are some, some pretty important differences. You may want to share your screen, Ron. Oh, it's not shared? Nope. That's a problem. Your voice is... Um, yeah, okay. Let me... That's right. I just loaded it up and didn't. You'd think I'd have it figured out by now, wouldn't you? How about that? <clears throat> you didn't see the yep, pretty you're picture. You're running now. What's that? It's Are we good, good now. Thank you. Sorry about that. So yeah, here we have a picture of our lots of toms in the winter. Um, probably getting ready for Thanksgiving there. But so again, a lot of it's similar to chickens. Um, I'll start out just real quickly, go through some of the different turkey breed options. If, if you're into exhibition poultry, you'll see that I have a mistake here. So I kind of corrected it. Technically, the American Poultry Association says there's one breed of turkeys and that is turkey. And then there's varieties within those. So I'll kind of intermix them and talk about breeds. But really, first of all, you kind of need to decide between two groups and that is what we'll call broad-breasted turkeys versus heritage breeds. And the, these are pretty different. Um, the care is gonna be pretty similar, but a couple of things are quite different. So the broad-breasted, as you might guess, have very large breast muscles. And contrast that with the heritage, which are more of the wild turkey size and shape and style. Um, and, and so I'll show you some examples of these. One really key point about this, I think that to be made is the heritage breeds are considered to be naturally mating. These broad breasted birds really don't mate very well. So if you wanna keep breeders and produce your own turkeys from year to year, they're probably not gonna be good or you need to learn how to do artificial insemination. <laughs> which is not terrible, but it's something you'd have to learn to do. So I'll just make a comment that really all of the commercial turkeys um, are produced with artificial insemination. So if you buy turkey at the store or turkey sandwich at the restaurant, that came from artificial insemination. So that's a big difference. The other real difference is the growth rate and the heritage birds are gonna be much slower growing and I'll show you a little bit on that in a few minutes. <clears throat> so here are just some different breeds and really your varieties. These are mostly different colors. There's some differences in size and things like that as well. Um, and I'll just kind of go through. Bourbon reds are fairly common. <clears throat> the bronze and again with the bronze which is kind of the wild type you can get broad-breasted or you can have heritage bronze that are not as, as muscled and, and broad-breasted. 
Narragansett is another color, royal palm, slate. Um, and then there's a few different white ones. <clears throat> there's what we call the Wisconsin midget that we used to have these on at the university for a long time and they were interesting little birds, um, but uh, we don't have turkeys anymore. And then again, there was the old bell, still small white, and there was the large one. So, so uh, again, differences there. Really, the care for most of them will be quite similar, other than mating. <clears throat> so I'll jump right into housing, and you'll probably need to brood these indoors. It would be pretty rare that you would have them out. Maybe if you have a turkey hen that sits her own and hatches them, she would raise them out. But otherwise, you're probably going to brood them. And really, a pretty typical brooding situation like you see here. And I won't go into all the details of that. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I would say with turkey poults as opposed to chickens, they really need probably a little more TLC that first week or two. Um, it's important to have them plenty warm, 95 Fahrenheit is usually what we shoot for. Um, if they get wet or cold, it can cause some real severe chilling problems and they're, they're pretty fragile at that age. So usually you wanna have them in a pretty con enclosed area like you see the brooder ring here so they don't get off somewhere and get away from the heat. Um, but other than that, a pretty standard brooding setup. <clears throat> As they get older, um, they become pretty hardy birds generally. And so you see here, these are some sort of range uh, housing units that you could use. Turkeys are pretty tough. You've probably seen wild turkeys out here, you know, living in the trees all winter. Um, Turkeys are pretty, pretty solid and can handle a lot of this. You do need some shade for them in the summer. And, you know, winter you want a little bit more than this, but, but they can handle pretty, pretty harsh conditions. Predators are still a problem, so you need to have a fenced area or some way to keep predators away from them. And again, I, I won't go deep into housing, but if you, there are a lot of, different housing plans out there um, for turkeys. I'll tell you, I shouldn't even say this, but when I was a kid, I actually raised turkeys in an outhouse for a while. So um, <clears throat> nailed the lid shut on them and they did fine. It was a nice little shed for them. So, so that's a little bit on housing. Again, nothing in great detail. Um, <clears throat> As I've been doing with some of my other talks, I'll talk a little bit about husbandry and, and look at this idea of flaws again. So feed, light, air, water, and space. I think I may have skipped light, but we'll talk about a little bit on each of these. Um, so one thing, and again, this is something that differs from chickens, is turkey poults need a little bit different diet. Um, and typically we would suggest about 28% protein to start. Um, and that's higher than what I suggested with chickens. Um, turkeys in nature probably would eat a lot of insects which are high in protein and not so much um, grain products when they're younger especially. So they probably need that. Um, Usually that'll end up being non-medicated. You can use medicated feed if you want, but usually it's hard to find the 28% that has that. Something else that I would point out, and I'll talk about this later on when we get to some health issues, but aside from protein, you also really need a little bit higher level of some other things in the uh, diet. And I've heard from some people that say, oh, I just give them chicken feed and they get by, they don't get as much protein, but they get by. And I think probably even 
almost more of a concern than the protein is some of these other things. And, and we're going to talk about some leg issues that you can have if you don't. So you do want to have a good quality feed for them. And a lot of people, if they can't get a turkey diet, will use a game bird feed, which is generally pretty well supplemented with these uh, different things. After a few weeks, you can lower that protein level um, and, and a little bit lower the, the level of the diet. And you may want to because protein tends to be expensive and as these turkeys grow, they're going to eat a lot of feed. Um, so you'll be pumping quite a bit of food through. And I put this in and these are our commercial numbers. So if you look at the broad breasted varieties, these would be ballpark um, to use. Now, some of the bronze might not be quite to this, but generally if you get broad breasted varieties, they're going to be commercial types and just massive growth. The commercial toms will reach almost 48 pounds by 20 weeks. Um, and so, you know, huge birds. It's really, it becomes quite difficult for most people to handle a bird like that. Um, as far as cooking it, I can tell you, we cook, we had one when I was young that was up around that weight and you don't have an oven that can handle it hardly. We used a Nesco roaster and kind of shoehorned it in to where it would fit. Um, but they do get quite large. And generally, commercially, these would be used for processing for you know, sandwich meat and things like that, um, deli meats. Two and a half pounds of feed per pound of gain. I've talked about feed efficiency in other talks, um, if you were there with those. I, I think that's something to consider if you're raising brain hen. Hens can reach 28 pounds by 20 weeks. Um, a lot of people will dress them more at, say, 19 or 20 pounds at about 13 weeks. So that's a nicer size for a lot of people for a family to have. Some of the heritage breeds, probably 20 to 25 pounds would be the, the maximum uh, weight for the toms and about 14 to 18 for hens. And you can see here again, taking quite a bit longer. And this is something that if you're only raising a few, it's not a big issue. But if you're raising very many, again, they tend to eat a lot more feed for the pounds of growth. Mentioned pasture, very common. It may help offset some feed costs, again, especially if you have a lot of insects and worms and things like that. Um, but the turkeys will graze some and, and they'll usually range quite a bit, so they, they will cover quite a bit of area. Things to consider if you're going to do that, predators, um, diseases, weather can be an issue. Weather, especially when they're young, generally as they get older, again, they, they get pretty hardy, but the young ones can be a problem. You hear all these stories about how turkeys will hold their head up in, in the rain and drown, and I don't think that's really true. Um, but they will chill very easily. And so if you leave them out in the rain and they get wet and cold, it, it, it may appear that that's the problem because they'll get pretty sick pretty fast. Here's just an example of some, again, they'll range quite a bit um, across the pasture area. So that's a little bit on feed. Um, I would say even if you have them on pasture, you're going to want to provide commercial ration for them. Um, it might cut it back a little bit. Again, lights, I didn't really get into, unless you're, you're getting into breeding with them, I think natural light is, is certainly adequate. Um, ventilation is, is important. I'll go pretty quickly through this. We need to provide fresh air and we need to remove some gases. Um, poor ventilation can cause problems, again, respiratory problems. Um, if you get wet litter, that can have some issues. You get more foot problems and bumblefoot. 
Um, you can get ammonia and it'll smell. <clears throat> Something that I haven't talked about with other birds, I don't think, but this is one you see on turkeys a fair amount, are these breast blisters like you see in this picture. And this is really sort of a scabby area on the breast of the turkey. And it's usually from sitting on poor litter. And you can imagine if you dress this turkey and want to have a nice turkey roasted in the oven and you've got this scabby area that you have to cut that skin off, it doesn't look very nice. And sometimes it actually will get infected further than just a scabby area. So that's a key thing you want to have good litter to avoid those. Um, as far as water, again, you want to have fresh water. Probably in the winter, this can be a challenge. I put here, and this is not specific to turkeys, this is for most animals, they drink double the weight of water as they eat feed. So if they're eating a quarter pound of feed a day, they'll probably drink a half pound of water. Um, so that's kind of a rough estimate. One thing that is a little bit different with turkeys, and, and probably this isn't a big issue for a lot of people, but with chickens, we would often encourage nipple waterers, and they're cleaner and you know less headache of cleaning. You don't have a big trough full of, of dirty water, stuff like that. Turkeys don't necessarily do real well with those. A lot of times they can't get enough water quickly to, to really drink adequate water. So what'll happen is then they can't get enough water, so then they don't eat as much because they they can't balance that out. So generally they don't do so well. And you usually see, these are pretty common, these what we call bell waters on the, the right. Um, and, and those work quite well, or just a regular water with a trough or, or something on it but they do tend to need quite a bit of water because they're eating a lot of feed. I put these numbers in, and I'm not gonna talk about feeder and water space, but you do need to look at that. But um, I would say these are really minimum requirements. So I think, you know, if you can provide a, more space, that's good. But as you get them larger, four square feet per bird um, and five if you have breeders, again, those I would say are a minimum. So I would try to have even a little more than that if you can. So that's, a, again, a really quick look at sort of feed light, air, water, and space for them. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about some common problems that you might encounter. And, and really leg problems tend to be one of the issues with turkeys. And I'll look at those in a little more detail and then we'll talk about a couple of others. And one of the big problems with, with leg problems in turkeys is there are so many different things that can cause them. So this is a pretty, I won't say common, but not an unusual thing to see with the turkey is that it's called a slip tendon where the the hock joint there has slipped and so now the leg is off twisted to the side. And really once you get this happen, once this happens in the turkey, there's probably not a lot you can do for it. That turkey will limp along for a while, but they're just not going to do well after that. And there's really not much to fix it. So you'd like to prevent it. But again, there are several different things that can do this. One is nutritional. I mentioned these magnesium, zinc, and choline. And so you wanna make sure that those are in the diet and they should be in a, a good balanced diet. Um, but if you're cutting other things and, and you know cutting back on the ration, that can be a problem. There are some bacterial diseases and I think I have, yeah, mycoplasma is one that can cause leg problems, can cause swelling of those hot joints, probably not the slip tendon so much as the just swelling. Um, and then bumblefoot, and you're probably used to that with chickens if you've seen that, but that's again, a, an infection of the feet. It can be due to bad litter. It can be due to a, you know getting a wood sliver or something in there and, and getting an infection. There are some viral 
diseases that can cause leg problems as well. And I won't go deep into those, but there are some. Um, there's also some genetic issues. I think the geneticists have done pretty well with selecting away from those genetic problems, at least with the broad-breasted types, but um, you might run into it in some of the heritage breeds. <clears throat> And then I'll just throw this in even there, there actually can be some incubator problems that can cause some leg problems, although that's usually more crooked toes and stuff like that. So again, so many different things that can cause these leg problems. So that's one that you might run into. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned mycoplasma as far as a leg issue. It also can be a respiratory problem. And this is one that you see a fair amount. It often, you'll see it in chickens as well. You can actually see this in some of the house finches that are at your bird feeder and things too. So it spreads from other birds. And in turkeys, quite often you get this sinusitis where you get the sinus there underneath the eye gets all swollen up, just looks horrible. Um, you also can get some air sac problems internally in the respiratory tract. So um, that one's pretty nasty. It kills turkeys probably even worse than chickens. So um, we try to avoid that. <clears throat> I will say this one is bacterial. And so you can treat it with antibiotics. Um, it, it's, not always real good, but, but sometimes you can treat it with antibiotics and, and treat the birds and be okay. The last one I wanna talk about in diseases, and certainly we can talk about more, but I've mentioned this one is blackhead. And it's kind of an interesting disease. And so I'll spend a little bit of time on it um, <clears throat> because it's, you hear about it a lot with turkeys. Um, <clears throat> it actually also affects peafowl and pheasants and things like that. So if you have any of those, this is one to be concerned about as well. The, the actual disease for it is histomoniasis and it's actually caused by a protozoa. So a little organism that's a little more advanced and complex than bacteria. <clears throat> what you often see with the turkeys is this bright yellow sulfur colored diarrhea. And then <clears throat> a lot of times they just die, okay? If you cut into them, you see these, what we always call bullseye lesions on the liver. So it looks like somebody drew little bullseyes on the liver and that's a pretty uh, notable thing that you see in this histomoniasis or blackhead. Why it's called blackhead, I really don't know because it doesn't really cause blackheads at all. So I don't, I've never seen a good reason why it was called that. So a little bit more on this one. <clears throat> and I won't go deep into this, but the life cycle of this involves these what are called oocysts, but you can think of them as fertilized eggs, really. Um, and those oocysts get picked up by some other worms that live in the bird's gut, or they can get spread directly as well. But these worms, and there are cecal worms, and there's actually some other uh, round worms that can do this, will, will pick up these eggs and ingest them and then they'll actually pass them out in their worm eggs. And so then another bird can come along and pick at that dropping and get it. Or another thing that can happen is earthworms can eat those cecal worm eggs, carry this along and then your turkey goes and eats an earthworm and can get infected. So it's, it's really a a circuitous route that it can go through to get to your bird. <clears throat> Couple things about this. Chickens often carry this and don't get sick. 
Now that's not 100% true. And they're actually having some issues with some broiler flocks and broiler breeder flocks that are having problems with this. But a lot of times chickens can carry it and aren't sick. So they can continue to spread this in the soil and into the worms. And then your turkey can get this. The point of all of this is this is the reason you typically hear that you shouldn't raise turkeys and chickens together, okay? Because again, your chickens can carry this, be just fine. They can pass it to the turkeys and your turkeys get sick and die, okay? And there is no approved treatment for blackhead, either preventative or treatment. Um, and so really, there's not much you can do other than try to keep your turkeys away from uh, these things. Some people will do some deworming and hope that that helps. And it might help some to cut down the worm load and therefore then cut down the, the worm egg uh, load. Um, but really the best thing is to try to keep other birds away from your turkeys that would have this. Now, what I tell people typically, if you've got a small flock and you wanna raise turkeys and chickens together, you can do that. Just know that you're potentially having your turkey flock at risk. And if they get this, there's really no treatment for it. So that's the risk you're taking and, and you should be aware of that ahead of time. So, so those are some diseases and problems that you might run into. Um, Certainly others, but those are some of the more common ones. Just a couple other things here, and then I know I'm getting long, but um, if you're gonna process turkeys, we talked about this quite a bit last week with meat birds in general, have a plan early as to what you're gonna do. If you're gonna take them somewhere, um, make sure you have that scheduled and, and know ahead. If you're gonna home process them, you know, be prepared. You'll need some equipment and things. Um, and again, you know, we talked quite a bit about this last week, but you are producing a food product in that case. So you want to make sure you use approved medications and clean processing and things like that. <clears throat> and I put the birds on here with food coloring. That's really <laughs> probably not a something that would make them an unsafe food product, but it kind of gets across the point that you don't want to do all these things. So that's a, a real speedy talk on turkeys. Um, but again, I'll, I'll try to answer other questions you have as we go. Um, I'll talk a little bit about guineas or guinea fowl. Um, I raised these as a kid, so I've had some experience with them. I raised turkeys as well. Um, but uh, they're kind of interesting birds if you're not familiar with them. Um, <clears throat> I put on here some, some sort of pros and cons to start with on these. And <clears throat> some positive things about the guineas, beautiful birds, okay? If you look at these, the, the spotted feathers, you'll find these guinea feathers used in all sorts of different um, you know, decorative hats and, and things like that. Beautiful spotted uh, plumage. And there's some other colors as well. The, the pearl is the most common. A lot of people get them because they eat a lot of bugs and ticks and things. And they're kind of well known for their tick control. Um, there's actually been research studies that have back this up that they do cut down on the tick populations where they are. As an aside, I'd love to see if chickens and turkeys and ducks all do the same thing, but the research was done with guineas, so we'll go with that. Um, they are pretty hardy, okay? The keats, the young ones can have some issues that I'll talk about, but they're generally pretty hardy birds. Um, now, some of the negatives about guineas, um, they're probably not necessarily real neighbor friendly. Um, 
if you have been around them, and I was going to try to get a, a sound to play on here, but you can all look that up and hear them if you haven't. They're loud, okay? I should, I could have put that as a pro that a lot of people say they're watchdogs because anything that comes on the farm, they'll go off and they will, um, you know, make a lot of racket. Um, they do range over a large area. So you're probably not gonna just be able to have them in your backyard. They're gonna <clears throat> go quite a ways. They fly very well. Um, so again, that can be an issue if you've got neighbors. Predation can be a problem. And a lot of that goes back to this wide ranging habit that you know they'll go off somewhere, maybe a quarter of a mile from your house and something will eat them. It's hard to keep that protected. The other place that they can have a real problem, and I think it comes up later, is their nesting habits. And that can be a real issue for predation. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about the Keats. I should have mentioned guinea fowl come from Africa originally, and they really have evolved in a sort of a dry, I won't say desert, but a dry climate. And so that's probably one of the biggest issues with the young ones is they chill very easily. So you really, if you're going to raise the Keats, I would suggest having some way to keep them penned up for at least the first couple of weeks, even if you hatch them under a chicken or let the guinea hatch her own. Um, they they just even the dewy grass in the morning they'll get wet and they'll get chilled and you'll lose a lot of them so that's a real challenge that first couple of weeks um, they do need to be warm and again like the turkeys about 28 percent protein i've seen some people tried to raise these on chicken feed and they just aren't healthy they died a lot of them and, and it was a real challenge <clears throat> the adult management again is pretty similar to chickens. They will they'll handle about the same situations. They range a lot if you let them, okay, but I would still have a, a commercial ration available for them. Um, my experience, they don't really use nest boxes very well. If they're out, they're probably gonna find some tall grass or a weedy area or something and they'll ground nest out there and they'll just make their own nest. Um, which again, becomes a real predation problem because a lot of things will eat them then while they're sitting brooding on the nest. <laughs> a bit of an aside, but that's what I've experienced in a lot of situations is you end up with a whole flock of males because the females all get eaten while they're brooding and uh, are incubating eggs and, and you end up with a whole bunch of males, uh, which is okay if you're looking for tick uh, eating and things like that. I said minimum three to four square, space, square feet per bird. Um, that's again a minimum. I would try to get more than that if you can. That's probably gonna crowd them a bit. I guess I've maybe already talked about a fair amount of this, but uh, again, nest selection, they will go out somewhere and they'll build a nest. Um, it's also a bit of a challenge if they do hatch then trying to collect those keats and again, they get wet and, and so it can be a real issue. They also probably won't use your coop very much unless you have them you know, fenced in and covered on top so they can't get out. They do like to roost up in trees, given an option or on top of a shed or something like that. Um, <clears throat> growing up, I could, I could always tell when winter got really cold and bad because they would come in for the night, but uh, generally they're gonna be in the trees. The other thing that seems a little strange with them, but I've seen this a fair amount, I, don't, I haven't seen any research on it, but they tend to, get run over a fair amount. I don't know why, but they'll go out on roads and and not get out of the way of cars. So I've seen a lot of them get hit where even the chickens didn't seem to have a problem. So. 
Um, a little bit on raising them with chickens. <clears throat> Again, a lot of people will try to do this, especially the young Keats. It, it probably helps keep them a little bit closer to home. They may not range quite as far if they're with the chicken, at least when they're young. Um, and the broody hen quite often will be a little bit better mother than having the guinea uh, hen do it. Right. Now, if you're gonna raise the adults together, guinea hen, or not guinea hens, guinea males um, can, they can be a little bit of a challenge with chicken roosters. They can fight and harass them a bit. So you either want to probably separate them or give them quite a bit of space. <clears throat> so I, I promised a little bit about a lot of things. So I think that's probably that. But I know Scott has some good stuff on ducks. Um, so I think. Yeah, let's, uh, anybody with questions regarding turkeys, guineas, or any other poultry besides ducks, how's that? <laughs> Get them out now. And while you're thinking about your questions, and you can put your questions either into the chat box, or you can just unmute yourself and ask it. While you're thinking about questions, I'm going to go ahead and put up our demographic poll. I realize most of you have answered this once or twice already in this series, but we are supposed to collect this data for every live event. So I'm going to pop that up now. And I'll stick around if you have questions later too, so. So I see the question peacocks. Um, a lot of the information would be fairly similar. They also are susceptible to blackhead, so that can be a concern. Um, the P chicks, are you going to need pretty high protein like the turkeys and the guineas? Um, they also are quite noisy, so the neighbor issues, and they will fly quite a ways too, so those can be some issues. Um, so I don't know if you have specific. Things. With their genetics, are they going to be closer to the guinea fowl as far as the young care with heat and things like that? I'm trying to think where they would fit in genetically. They're probably closer to a pheasant. Um, I would say, yeah, that's exactly it. The neighbors, they don't seem to, to stay on the, their own farms very much or, or housing. Um, they're, they're closer to a pheasant from a genetic standpoint, I would say. Um, but, uh, yeah, the care will be pretty similar there. You're going to need to keep them pretty warm. I haven't heard quite the issues with with dampness and chilling, but I suspect you'd want to launch that a bit. Okay, any other questions for Ron at the moment? Speak up or maybe hang on to them, I guess, for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and in this and then get my screen shared, but actually I need to get the right file up first. So hang on just a second. Okay, so if somebody wants to chime in and just make sure that our audio is still coming through okay, as we switched over just a little bit here. Yeah, looks good and sounds good. Okay, 
But like I say, we're going to spend a little bit of time. I think everyone is, that is on tonight has heard my voice, at least in one of the other ones, but I'm the Marinette and O'Connell County Ag agent up in the, the far northeast corner of the state. And with me tonight is my wife, Jill. And all, I think all of the pictures, except for one of the slides regarding the, uh, <laughs> or a couple of the uh, breed or variety slides, and then uh, one of the ones on one of the diseases, but most of the rest of the photos are from Jill. So um, we're going to say we're going to talk about a few things, um, a few specific things, a few generalities, but that's why I wanted Ron to go first tonight because his discussion um, was a little bit more detailed. And so we can just kind of go through a few things here. But uh, there are a few definite basic differences between ducks and most of the other poultry species that we've talked about in this series, they definitely need a, a different level of water access to be healthy and clean. It's not that they can't survive on a similar level of water than what turkeys or chickens or others need, but they will not be as healthy as they probably should be, and they definitely will not be as clean as they want to be if they do not have water access, and we'll get into that in a little bit more here. Um, they definitely need more space than chickens. Um, they uh, get the numbers in a little, or we get the numbers here in a little bit, but uh, they are they are definitely going to require a little bit more roosting space and living space completely, and a different type of roosting location. Um, there are a few breeds of ducks that will roost more similarly to chickens and turkeys and guineas and things like that but a lot of them do roost on the ground, so right on the litter as well. So you need to have that thought through when you are, especially if you're working with mixed breeds or depending on what you have. Um, a little bit more similar to the things we've been talking about compared to chickens, they are a little bit stronger foragers. So they do tend to roam a little bit more. Uh, that can occasionally create issues, even though it may cut down on your ration costs, it may create some other issues. And they definitely are more likely to have issues with gnats. And we've talked about gnats uh, a couple of, you know, a few weeks ago, I know we talked about that for a while, but in particular, the, the uh, slower developing breeds of ducks are gonna have more issues with those. And then of course, on the fun side of life, uh, well, not fun for the ducks, I guess, but ducks are definitely harder to pluck. So on that side of life, you gotta, you gotta think about that a little bit too. Um, but when you think about it, why do we even wanna consider having ducks? compared to chickens, um, because they are more expensive to get as ducklings. There are some things we have to think about differently and take care of differently. Well, here are some of the possibilities. And I'm gonna let Jill talk for a second because my voice is going here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> ducks in our experience have usually um, don't damage your garden quite as often, but the only damage that they'll do um, that I have noticed is they may trample some things if it's small, like if you have a patch of lettuce or something that they may walk right over it because they're foraging and going after insects. Um, but usually that's not too bad. Um, one of the things as a person who gardens perennials and things like that, they do tend to annihilate my hostas. Um, they will eat them the second they start leafing out. So I do protect my hostas from the ducks. But other than that, they are pretty harmless when it comes to gardens. Um, they may pick at some lettuce leaves sometimes or you know things like that that they may need or want, but they don't dig things up like chickens do. Um, so they're nice for that reason. Um, they're usually easier to care for most of the time because they're pretty self-sufficient. Um, they're usually friendlier. You can feed them from your hand, especially when they're young, if you spend a lot of time with them. Um, I, we've noticed that there's less disease issues than with chickens. Um, many of the duck varieties um, can handle the, the cold that we have here in Wisconsin um, relatively well. Uh, we don't have any issues with that. Um, they can handle the heat better as well. Um, so overall, they do much better than chickens in, the, in that department in our experience. Um, eggs are definitely larger, uh, especially um, the scoby eggs are very large um, and a harder shell than chickens. So be prepared to give them a good whack if you're going to use them for baking. They are great for breads and 
um, cakes and things like that. They're even good as a fried egg, I, I think, uh, not so good as scrambled eggs. It makes tends to make them very firm. So if you like very firm scrambled eggs, then you can use duck, duck eggs for that. Um, but the eggs are very good tasting and um, haven't had any issues with that. Um, some ducks do lay as well as the chicken can. Um, and we'll get into some of the breeds later on that will let you know which ones would do that. Um, and if you have if you have an area where a lot of people like the duck eggs, then it would be beneficial for you to look into that. Uh, most ducks are really good foragers. Um, we have some ducklings right now that are fully feathered just now, and they follow around a couple of the adult Muscovy hens that uh, ducks that walk around, and it's kind of fun watching them. Um, but they forage around and get especially snails, slugs, um, which kind of bummed I can't let them walk around my hostas because I do once in a while I let them because they get rid of slugs so much better. And since I've been protecting them from my hostas, I've noticed my slug population has been going up again. So if you have a lot of slugs, then get some ducks. Um, they are also, um, in our experience as well, less aggressive um, and less aggravating to neighbors, especially if you're looking at quiet ducks like a Muscovy, they don't make a lot of noise. They make kind of like a hissing noise sometimes when they get excited, but um, other ducks quack and they're kind of fun to listen to. So we'll talk about some of the breeds as well. Some of them are noisier than others, um, but they aren't going to be as loud as say roosters um, and annoying your chicken or uh, annoying your neighbors like chickens can. So this is one of my favorite sayings. <laughs> you don't have a slug problem, you have a duck deficiency. Um, if you want to get rid of slugs, like I said before, getting ducks is a very good way to get rid of the slug problem. And with the uh, buildup in slug populations and fields in some areas of the state after these last few years of the water, we might have to try to get more ducks in the country. But anyway, so here you see one of the photos from Joe, some of some young Muscovies. These are little ducklings here. But they are, uh, most ducks, if given the opportunity, are really good foragers. You see them really fanning out and going through an area. I mean, they're not quite the same level of insect hunters that you see when you see a flock of cranes or turkeys going through an alfalfa field or something like that, where they're literally walking through uh, squadrons. But they will have that same effect, and they are very good. Um, but you, you can see some differences in breeds here just with this photo. That's why we have this one in the, in the presentation, is that with uh, Muscovies and some of the other types are stronger foragers and then some of the more, uh, maybe, a, maybe the right word would be the more domesticated duck species. Lazy. Breeds, yeah, <laughs> lazy is another one. With the jumbo pecans in the background, they're just kind of sitting there hanging out in the shade and in the water. So. Well, one thing I will point out about this too, with the two breeds, um, sometimes mixing breeds works really well and sometimes it doesn't. And in this case for this photo, when I had the jumbo pecans, um, they were kind of rescue ducks from a neighbor who was mistreating his animals. So we ended up taking in his birds and kept them quarantined for a while. But these jumbo pecans were bullies. They would not allow my Muscovies to take baths at all in any of our pools. So they were really sassy ducks. Um, so keep that in mind if you're going to keep a couple of different kinds of breeds. You want them to get along. And that's the uh, segue into our next thing, you know, with looking at a few things to consider. I mentioned space needs before, and um, they say some of the, the duck breeds are a little bit more space conscious. They don't, they don't like being as close as chickens do, either on the roost or uh, roosting if they're together, at least especially when they get to adult um, stages. They, as young ones, they will, they will roost right together, practically on top of each other, just like what you're probably used to seeing with chickens. But uh, as adults, they do tend to have more space in between them, and they, they like that, and they kind of need it to be happy and healthy. Um, when you think about the different breeds with ducks, you, you definitely do want to think about that. One thing that, that we have seen happen is that ducks will interbreed just like chickens will. And if you are trying to keep separate breeds, that can cause problems as well as create uh, sterile <laughs> ducklings for the most part, at least again in our experience and, and others who uh, have allowed that to happen. Some 
breeds of ducks are pretty strong flyers. Uh, I remember driving down a state uh, highway here in Marinette County last year, and I was trying to figure out what is that coming toward me. And there was a Muscovy flying right down the middle of the road, right at me. <laughs> and and that one that one was a solid half mile away from its place. And I also remember you know, Rod was shared a couple of these things that happened to her that when he was younger. I remember duck hunting in western Minnesota, and we literally had a flock of Muscovies fly into the pond we were hunting on, and they were probably a mile from where they were raised. So every once in a while, we'll see some types of Muscovies that are exceptional strong flyers, and others, most of them, if they're pretty well cared for, probably not quite as much. That's a good point, though. If ducks are happy where they're at, they generally do not find a reason to leave. Um, I had neighbors who had uh, up the road from me, probably a quarter mile, half mile, more like a half mile, um, and they had ducks fly away all the time because they weren't fed properly, they weren't taken care of properly, um, and my ducks never did that. Um, we provided adequate space and food and water for them, and they didn't find their reason to want to leave. So you can see some of these other things on the, on the slide here, but one of the ones that we will be spending some time on is water needs. And Ron and I were actually working with a poultry producer in Northeast Wisconsin over the course of last year because he had added ducks into his uh, poultry management mix and was facing some difficulties with housing. And one of them was dealing with the water differences because Ducks do drink differently. They also use water differently. Uh, and it is something that they really do need, that you do need to address ahead of time. Otherwise, you're going to have some unhappy ducks. Or you're going to have some really messy coops that need to be cleaned a lot more than you're used to. And you're going to go through a lot more bedding than you're used to. And the costs for everything else that you do on your, your farm can, can really go up. So one thing to, to think about, I mean, chickens are one thing, ducks are a little bit different when it comes to the, the real egg laying ducks. They are more routine oriented than some of the chicken or than most of the chicken breeds really are. And you know, if they get out of that routine, you're gonna notice it because their egg production is gonna change really quickly and it's gonna go downhill and it can be impacted for a little bit longer than you what you might think because they are just a little bit more sensitive to those types of things. Even so much as um, in the mornings, we give whole corn to our ducks just as a treat. And if we don't give it to them in the morning, um, I have our male duck, our, our drake will follow me around until I do. <laughs> so they, they are definitely routine oriented animals. But that can be a good thing when it comes to uh, working with uh, coops and housing and stuff like that. And we'll get into that in a second too. Um, one thing, that, um, at least in our experience, is a little bit different as far as the ratios of males to females uh, from ducks to chickens. For the medium and large breeds, you want around one male for every six females. And for small breeds, you can increase that a little bit more like one to eight. And if you have less than this, that will definitely create problems. Uh, not only will the, uh, the entire coop be unhappy, but your ducks definitely will. And it will impact their health, their production, their growth. Uh, many different things can go wrong if you go too high or uh, with that ratio of male to female. And that's for um, the same breed of ducks not an intermixed breed of ducks. I haven't found that, um, we've, we've raised numbers of different kinds of ducks and we have found that the best overall health and everything else happens when you have this ratio per um, type of duck. So if you have a one male to uh, six females um, for Muscovies or any other, to keep them by breed, um, so you can have a couple different kinds of breeds together, but make sure that you have enough females to keep everybody happy and the males in retrospect for that. So a couple of other points, again, you can see um, general, you know, obviously, you need good food and clean water for good egg production and overall health. 
Um, most of the smaller breeds are a little bit better on your egg blending habits, but they're also tend to be a little bit more high strung. And we'll talk through some of those things when we get into the breeds at the end here. Um, but we talked about the fact that they like routine. And if you give them the routine and you uh, help them stay on that routine, ducks can be very good uh, as far as going into the coops and using the coops properly and things like that. Here you see a a uh, uh, Muscovy hen with her ducklings trailing behind her. And as long as they have a good role model or you help them understand what they need to do, you can get those ducklings trained really nicely and you can get them to use your coop facilities, whatever that may be. And then they're going to be able to, you're going to be able to have a better <laughs> situation mm -hmm. because if you don't train them, then you're going to have problems. Uh, Ron talked about what will happen with guinea or guineas when they're not um, used to going into the coop. Well, ducks can do the same thing. We've got a lot of uh, producers that end up talking to me about some of the issues they're having and getting their ducks to use the coops is one of the biggest things, particularly if they either get adult birds and bring them in uh, or they don't have a very strong setup and good uh, plan and good, again, good role models to, to work from. So here you see some, some of the different ways that ducks will utilize water. Obviously, as ducklings, you need to be a little bit careful because believe it or not, some people actually don't believe this, but ducklings do drown. If they can't get out of a water source easily, they can uh, get wet and get soaked and either get you know chilled and have damage that way or they can't actually drown. So you do need to have appropriate depths of water for the different ages and sizes of birds that you may have, particularly for the different ages though. But then as they get larger, you have a little bit more freedom, I guess, to use some different things, but you don't need to have a stock pond or a farm pond or access to a lake or a wetland or anything else like that. You can utilize different types of things to be able to give them access to water but they do need to have deep enough water so that they can get their heads under the water. And that is a major health issue and we'll show you why in just a little bit. As far as the utilization of that then for if, as long as you have any kind of plants, you can recycle that water and it becomes, well, as, as Jill calls it, duck tea, uh, but you can also you, know, you do have to think about it from the food safety standpoint. So if you weren't using that water in the vegetable garden, be a little bit cautious about that. It's great for roses or shrubs or things like that. I used to use it on my rhubarb though, but it does work really well for shrubs to keep them near that area and the ducks keep them fertilized that way. And some breeds are definitely more water oriented than others. Muscovies, although they need water uh, and will not be happy if they don't have access to it, they're less water oriented than most of the other breeds in reality. Do you see a, a photo of some of the young ones that actually Jill talked about before? Um, and this slide serves two purposes. One, when you're sourcing your ducklings, make sure that you trust the source. This is, the, this is supposed to be a group of ruins and it's actually at least two different breeds, if not three because where we got them from was not quite true to their word on that. And it was a commercial source, but I, I won't name names, so to speak. Um, but the, a lot of the, the puddle ducks, the dabblers, they go stir crazy if they don't have water. And it will create problems for you and for the rest of the birds in your flock. Uh, so make sure that they have good access to water for their well-being, both mentally and physically, but physically is also exceptionally important because of the way they need to get their ears cleaned out. So again, they can utilize different types of things, but if you have ducklings, uh, again, this photo was left in here for a purpose. If you have ducklings, they have to be able to get out of that water. You really do have to pay attention to that. Um, if you uh, are raising your own ducklings or you're allowing uh, the hands to raise them up, you've got to make sure that all the water sources where they might be able to have access to have a way for them to get out. Otherwise, you will probably lose ducklings there. That's a little bit heartbreaking to see that happen. Oops, going too far. Winter is also important. And 
this is one of those photos where you can see the hand looking up at the Muscovy Drake going like, yeah, just try it, you know. Um, but they need water in winter as well. And a good rule of thumb is to be able to give them water uh, um, in an absolute minimum of twice a week during the winter. Um, but, you know, they appreciate it as often as they can get it. Um, here you kind of see the number that we go by <laughs> is around 20 degrees. As long as it's sunny and over 20 degrees, we will make sure that they have water available uh, to them during the winter. But this slide gets into some of the, the issues that they can have, or, or the primary one, and that is mites and gnats that get into their ears and can kill the ducklings, unfortunately, more quickly than you might think. Um, so they need to have their heads get, getting under the, under the water surface and be able to get their ears cleaned out. And, you know, just like Ron has talked about multiple times, you know, they need twice as much water as they have for feed intake. So they don't have a good source of clean, cool water, your egg production and your uh, meat production, i.e. the gain per day is gonna go down. It also helps them stay clean. Again, you know, I, I work with a lot of producers over the course of the year and I have a lot of them tell me, oh, my ducks don't need water. And you see them from a distance and their white breed ducks look almost as brown as their brown breed ducks sometimes. And uh, they may be okay, but they're not as healthy as they want to be. Ducks like their feathers to be clean. Um, and if they can't preen their feathers, it makes them, I guess in a best way to put it is depressed. <laughs> um, they don't like to be dirty. They, they like each feather to be clean. And again, Ron talks about water intake, so we won't go into that in more, de any more detail. That last point is when I added beware of moving water. Um, when I was growing up, one of the only times my mom and dad had a large flock of ducks, <laughs> we had a very large rain event hit western Minnesota, and we happened to live next to a seasonal waterway. And we never did figure out what county our ducks ended up in because they got into that seasonal waterway and shoot it down, they shot downstream and we never saw one of them again. One more thing about water too, in, this, in the winter time, they will take snow baths. Um, ducks will find fluffy snow and if they don't have water access, they will find snow and, and take a bath that way as well. We're not going to go into great detail in most of the rest of the slides, but we are going to make sure that everyone has access to these after the fact. So you will be getting an, an email from me with these slides in a PDF form. Um, but we do get asked about duck eggs. And so these are just some of the facts that go along with duck eggs. Um, uh, Joe mentioned some of the things beforehand. They do have a different shell. They do have a little bit different vitamin. Uh, and mineral content, uh, mostly better, but in some cases, in one case at least, uh, being vitamin B a little bit lower. Um, but they, they are a good egg. Uh, That's but, a good cholesterol, by the way, not yeah. a bad cholesterol. <laughs> I didn't put that in there. <laughs> um, and there is a size difference in the density difference. Um, we, our average Muscovy egg is a approximately the same as 1.75 uh, large or extra large chicken eggs. And we have severe difficulty storing them because there is no egg carton made that will fit them because they are larger than jumbos. Um, but that's just something you have to deal with um, and be ready for. Uh, but as I did mention before, if you do have a good or good source for them, uh, the duck egg value is higher than chickens and can, can be a pretty good sales point for you. Um, ducks are also obviously raised for meat, and that's where well, what most of them are actually raised for compared to eggs. And there's a number of breeds that do very well with this. The most popular meat ducks, ducks are the, the Pekin and Jumbo Pekins, and particularly the Jumbo Pekins. You know, they, they would be the equivalent of the broad breast of the white turkey that Ron was talking about. They can't quite get to 48 pounds or whatever size Ron said that those gobblers can get to, um, but they are certainly the fastest to get to market and edibility size. Uh, so they are, and, and they are more efficient as well compared to any of the other ones. Most ducks are pretty efficient, especially if they, they are foragers, but uh, that's efficiency in feed 
conversion, not necessarily in kind, because they are slower to develop than chickens. Um, so, you know, it is something that you have to think about a little bit differently because they, if you are raising them for meat, they're going to be around a little bit longer, usually somewhere in that four months range rather than the eight to 10 weeks that most people raise their chickens out to. But in comparison from a Pekin to a Muscovy, a Pekin is like a five-year-old little kid that never stops talking because they never stop quacking, especially if they see people. And Muscovies are the exact opposite. They're quiet because they don't make a whole lot of noise. They do have their own noises, but they're quiet. They don't, they don't do a whole lot. Um, so yeah, Pekins and Jumbo Pekins, Pekins are the noisiest ducks I've ever owned. Um, so if you can stand that or you think it's really great, then you'll enjoy them. Um, the Scobies are our favorite ducks because they are the least fatty meat. Um, they're a large duck. They grow slower, but we have found very worth the wait. Um, in that slowness too, uh, they don't get their feathers as quickly as some of the other ducks. So we may need to wait an extra month before a month or two before you can um, butcher them versus other ducks. Unless you really like pin feathers, then you can go ahead and do a <laughs> um, So Rooms or Aylesbury's and the Swedishes, the blue and black Swedish. And if you've never seen a black Swedish, just think Daffy Duck, because that's what Daffy Duck was, was a, a black Swedish. Um, but it, it might, most of the large and medium large breeds will work. So a few different issues. Uh, this is just an intro slide, and I'm going to go through these in more detail. But too high of protein or energy content for the growing ducklings can lead to a physical condition called angel wing. And I'll show you that. There is a way to fix it, but you've got to catch it early. Um, another one that is nasty is a bacterial disease called leukocytosis. I probably butchered that pronunciation. Ron will uh, correct me if he wants to get it. Um, but that's a bacterial <laughs> disease that is spread by fighting gnats and midges and can be very severe in some parts of our state. Um, and in general, ducks are more prone to that issues, especially the slowly developing ones. And we'll, we'll... Um, also with that, if, if you want to know what the signs are of what, you know, if there's a gnat problem, usually it looks like your ducklings are drunk or they're about to fall over. They don't look right. A lot of times you can dunk their head a number of times to get rid of those gnats out of their ear area ear canal or their whole bodies, uh, make sure that they can get dunked. Sometimes you can save them if you do that, and sometimes you can't. Mm -hmm. So the first one we're going to deal with, um, and again, we'll try to do this fairly quickly, but is, is angel wing. Uh, so in general, you want to have a lower protein content. You know, Ron was talking about uh, species that need a very high a very high protein content for their young to develop properly. Ducks are the, precisely the opposite. We want to have a lower protein content. Otherwise, we can promote this angel wing uh, criteria or issue. It's a physiological problem, essentially. And then also try to minimize high starch portions or additions, again, especially when they're still developing. Once they're at full adult stage, you don't have to worry about it. You can basically treat them like you would most chickens, and they'll actually be fine um, unless you have specific uh, duck breeds that have particular things. And angel wing is most likely to develop in that uh, two to three month range, so that you know eight to twelve weeks. It can be fixed if you catch it early and you want to. So if you are if you're working with breeders or things like that, then you may actually want to fix it because those top two photos are what they look like, and it is a fairly specific to waterfowl. As you see here a, a, a goose in the back, um, and. Yeah, they, they kind of look like uh, they're ready for takeoff at all times, but they actually, because the wing is twisted slightly, they actually create problems for them. Um, it's more cosmetic than physical damage as far as their overall health, but it does create some minor issues for them. And you can see here an image I pasted from, a couple images I pasted from poultry DVM. Um, there are treatments for it. it. The ducks look weird. I guarantee you they're not happy if you do that to mm -hmm. them, but they, it is treatable, but you have to wrap uh, either around the entire duck or around the wings at least, but it's better. The better treatments are the ones that go around the entire duck. 
but again, um, it's something that you've got to deal with right away when you see it starting to develop. Once you get to the size and age of those two uh, in the top photos there, you can't do anything. They're, they're set uh, because the, the bone structure has set that way. Okay, big word, bad disease, that leukocytosomonosis. Um, it is truly a bad disease. I, I, I say it, you know, I sound it in, in just a little bit as far as the word, but we have lost many, many, many Muscovy ducklings to this disease. Um, and even on the, the Merck Vet Manual webpage, their, their resources directly say that this disease can cause up to 70% mortality in ducklings in many parts of the country. And if they do survive it, they're going to be less thrifty. They're going to be slower growing. They're going to have less egg production. They're going to have uh, the eggs themselves are going to not be as viable. You know, this can be a very serious disease in ducks, even though it may not kill adults, it will create problems for them, uh, at least for the rest of that year, if not for the rest of their life. Um, there are some ways to try to deal with it, but really it's about trying to keep the gnats and biting midges off of the ducklings. Um, and so you can use screening, you can use indoor housing, you know, with, uh, you know, buildings, you know, coops, et cetera. There are some repellents that have some effect. Uh, vanilla does work. Yeah, including vanilla. Uh, we did talk about that again a few weeks ago. There are some other types of repellents that can have some level of effect. You can use insecticidal treatments as long as they're um, labeled for use in livestock facilities. But, or raised ducks later on. Yeah, or change your timing. And that's what we've had to go to at our place because we have such serious uh, issues with two different species of gnats. Uh, and then along with that, we also have some biting midges. But we have the first species of mat, gnat that we deal with is the normal buffalo gnat or black fly. And that one we can handle. The, the ducklings very rarely have serious issues with that. But right after they're done, so in other words, right now, is when we have a second species of gnat that is smaller and they really target um, ducklings. And, I have seen individual ducklings with literally hundreds of those gnats on them. So not only will they do blood feeding and cause problems that way, but then they, they do spread this bacterial disease and they also get into the ears as we talked about before and can cause pretty serious issues. Um, so we're just gonna finish off with just some in introductions to a few breeds, um, a couple of the more common ones. And just so that you know what they look like and what they are primarily used for. Um, Khaki Campbell is probably the best known egg laying duck in, in North America. Um, they had 300 plus eggs per year. Um, very good egg production. They're usually white, but you will get some color variation from them. But do make sure that you're getting true breeds. There's a little bit of um, genetic variation in this out there. They do like calmer environments. So if you're if you've got a mixed species area, you know, sometimes they're they're not gonna settle as well and not gonna lay eggs as well as they would like to do. And they are a smaller breed of duck, so not a not a big breed, not a great meat breed per se, but very, very good egg production. But they do like their neighbors. They they wanna be in flocks of uh, you know, 50 to 200 or so is what the research shows with sufficient space, but they are very adaptable. And the only egg layer that might be better than them as far as breed-wise is the Welsh harlequin. Um, and when you see that here, um, some people say, well, they look a little bit like a runner duck, but yeah, not really, especially when you see them moving in, in action. Um, again, fairly small duck, but outstanding egg layer, very active foragers, very good mothers. Um, also known for their winter hardiness and their lean meat, but again, they're a much smaller duck than most of the actual meat breed types, so less commonly raised for that, but more for their egg production. The runner ducks, the picture says it all, I guess, I don't know, they're, <laughs> they're kind of an oddball looking duck. Um, very small duck in general, most of them are. There, there will be some that will be a little bit larger up in that five pound range, but most of them are definitely on the lighter um, side. They are pretty mobile. 
And the fourth point there is very important. For them to be happy, they like being in large groups. You know, we, we mentioned that with the Khaki Campbells, but Khaki Campbells, they don't like it as well, but the runner guys really don't like it if they're in a small group. They really like being in large groups. Um, so, and the last point on this slide is one that I, I left on there just specifically to mention it. You know, if you want to have ducks, but you still want to annoy your neighbors, <laughs> then get call ducks. They're called call ducks for a reason. reason. They never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last couple of breeds here. Um, you've heard us talk a lot about Muscovy, so we're not gonna spend any more time on this other than I wanna show you a couple of photos specifically to them because they do have a couple of nuances. Um, the carnuncles um, that you see around their eyes and faces are one of the identifying characteristics of the breed and that changes as they age that's one of the ways that you can know your birds as far as which ones are the younger ones which ones are the older ones they are quiet they are friendly they are the largest of the duck breed as far as overall meat uh, skeleton size uh, a jumbo pecan may weigh as much if not more than even a, a big male muscovy but the skeletal size is much larger on a, on a Drake Muscovy. And they are really good mothers and good brooders. Uh, and they certainly have their personalities, and, mm -hmm. you know, like all of them do probably, but they are slower developing now. So these are going to be birds that you're going to be butchering at four to five months usually, sometimes even longer, depending on when you are hatching them out. So here you see a male Muscovy uh, and a pronounced carnival. Um, and you know, it's just something, again, that they're known for. Um, different breed, uh, different color patterns on Muscovies. You see pure white, you see the pied as normal, and then the chocolate color that you see here and with some duckling variation as well. Now, this I left in there, not because of the providing shady areas, but that's an important thing. But what I want you to notice on this slide is these are teenage Muscovies. These are fairly old ducklings in reality. These are probably six-week-old ducklings, give or take. But notice they don't have their feathers yet. And that's the emphasis that, that, uh, that I wanted to point out. And this is why they are such... Uh, of why the gnats and midges are such problematic uh, problems for the Muscovies is because their ears do not get covered over in time. Um, we have gone to fall raising of Muscovy ducklings because we just lost too high of a percentage of them. It, it almost didn't matter what we did. So the pretty white ones that are often in pairs and such are the pecans and jumbo pecans, but they are bossy. Um, when around other ducks. They're not a horrible a breed in general, but they are a little bit bossy when they're in mixed company. Um, they are meat layers for the most part, uh, and, or meat layers, meat breeds <laughs> for the most part. They will lay plenty of eggs too, but because they are so large, um, they're not very good mothers. So um, Ruins, basically big mallards, um, but there are two types, both the standard and the production. They are a heavy set, you know, primarily meat type breed. So they don't, they do not lay nearly as many eggs uh, as a lot of the other breeds, although they're they're right there, if not higher than with the Muscovies. But again, just like we mentioned with the Pekins, if they, if they do set, then they're not gonna be very great mothers, so. Um, I mentioned this website before, but one of the things in our area that we struggle with is finding vets that know which end is up on a, on a on chicken sometimes, it seems. Um, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but Poultry DVM is a really good web page to visit if you are struggling with veterinary issues. Uh, so that's something to consider visiting. Okay. Any questions about ducks as I stop sharing? And we will actually, we can, we'll just open it up to anything as far as whatever you may want for questions, uh, comments, anything, Ron or Carolyn, that you want to share yet before we.
My dad didn't hear um uh, about what, what you said about putting ducks and chickens together. Okay, yeah, ducks and chickens actually, for the most part, they do interact pretty well together, especially as adult birds. Now, with younger birds, they can be problematic because the younger ducks need a little bit lower protein. Otherwise, they're going to have that angel wing issue potentially cropping up. Um, and as ducklings, they definitely need to be by themselves because most ducklings are going to be much better served if you feed them wet food rather than just pure dry food, especially for the first week or two, but for some breeds, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, so as young ones, that's where it's important to, to take care of them and probably have them separated. But beyond that, they can usually do pretty well together. As with any chickens, ducks, or poultry, if you have... Um... A, a barn or a housing situation where you can have chicken wire or some kind of wire where they can't peck at each other but see each other, um, where they kind of grow up looking at each other and getting used to each other, that is very helpful. Um, that way when you do intermingle them together, whether foraging outside or in the barn or in your housing, then you'll have a lot less problems with them not getting along. Other questions, comments, anything else? Ron, did you have any final thoughts that you wanted to convey this evening? I don't think so. I think we covered a lot of different things. So um, certainly if, if questions do come up, you know, we have, you have Scott's contact information. I think I'll, we'll send mine out with that too, so. Okay, again, then, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And I think most of you have joined us for at least one, if not a couple of the others in this series. So we appreciate your involvement in it. You can look forward to a few i'm going to probably send one email out with for each session that has the resources and the slides from each of the webinars that we conducted so that way if you are not interested in one of them at all you can just basically delete that message and then keep the other ones and have those resources uh, available to you um, and as Ron mentioned, that will include Ron's information front and center, but then also a, a few of the others of us in the extension that work with uh, poultry issues. So if nobody else.